This show is about your mental health. While it's supported by the pillars of positivity and hope, if you find yourself in crisis, please reach out for help. In many communities in both the United States and Canada, you can dial 211 to be connected to mental health and crisis services in your region. While it may seem like it at times, you are not alone. Hello, I'm Kevin Frankish. Welcome to The Happy Molecule. The ancient Greeks and Romans had what they thought was the only treatment for someone with what eventually would be called bipolar disorder. Execute them. After all, they felt they were possessed by demons. Bi, meaning two. Pole, meaning either of two related opposites. So extreme highs, mania, to extreme lows, depression. It's perhaps the most misunderstood and most often misdiagnosed mental health disorder there is. Even now in the 21st century, we're just starting to scratch the surface of what causes it and how to treat it. Experts argue we're over-diagnosing it. More say it's under-diagnosed. Dr. Roger McIntyre is one of the world's foremost researchers into the disorder. He speaks to me from his home in Toronto. It's time to expand the mental health conversation and try to become more aware of bipolar disorder right now on The Happy Molecule. Dr. Roger McIntyre, thank you so much for being with me. Kevin, it's great to be with you uh, having this discussion. Such an important topic. It is a very important topic, probably one of the more misunderstood parts of, of mental health treatment uh, that, that we have right now, but we're understanding it a lot more thanks to you. In fact, Thomson Reuters calls you one of the world's most influential scientific minds. Mm. That's pretty amazing. That must be an honor. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege that's been given to me by people and families who have bipolar and depression, so I thank them entirely for the incredible privilege. Bipolar is something we're hearing a lot more about, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's increasing in numbers. You know, it's not. And what we can say is if we were to look at how common is bipolar, so Kevin, you know, it's interesting. I started my career way, way back when, and I, one of the very first studies I did was in community-based epidemiology. Simply put, how common are disorders in the population? And I was chapping on people's doors. Um, it's a small county in the southwestern part of the province of Nova Scotia. Um, it was called the Sterling County Study, one of the longest going, longest standing studies looking at mood disorders ever. And it turns out that the prevalence of bipolar disorder in that study and other studies has been pretty consistent um, at around one to two percent. Um, and that's been replicated not just in high income countries like Canada and the United States, but also in low and middle income countries. So pretty consistent. And just to finish that, maybe to punctuate a point is that, you know, as the goalposts get wider, more goals are scored. And as we expand and widen the definition of bipolar disorder, which occurs in some parts of the world, you tend to get a higher prevalence rate than if you have a more narrow definition. The goalposts are a little narrower, you have a lower prevalence, but it's about one to two percent. So according to the World Health Organization, you look at around, oh, you know, you know it's maybe up to about 75 to 100 million people uh, approximately have bipolar disorder. And we are now, and in, in, uh, you've described it to me as an exciting time as far as, as research goes. And I, I, have we misunderstood bipolar so long that, that maybe we're a little bit behind in the research? That's a really interesting way to, to characterize it. And I think you've put your finger on something. Yes is the short answer. Uh, bipolar disorder has often been, I was almost like the kind of neglected cousin or poor cousin of other conditions uh, for a host of reasons. Um, frankly, we had fewer treatments for bipolar, relatively speaking, to some other conditions. And, and that does affect some of the activity going on in, in research broadly. Uh, but we are, in fact, 
uh, seeing much more research in bipolar, in part because it's recognized by governments. It's a, it's a national health priority. It's clearly very common. Its impact on disability uh, is staggering. The impact on human um, agency is immeasurable. And this has come to the attention, as I said, not just of governments and academia, uh, but also of the private sector. And, and, and so taken together, there has been much more interest an interest in trying to understand what are the boundaries of this condition? How do we diagnose it? How is it different from, say, depression? Um, what causes it? And can we prevent it? Can we maybe even preempt it in the future? And, and, and can we cure this? So these are questions that are now on the table. I, you know what I should have asked off the, off the top? What is bipolar? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's still a question that, frankly, uh, we still debate. I can tell you what it's not. It's not two poles. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, 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 to go back a little bit, the people may remember the name manic depression. In fact, manic depression was a name that was coined, oh, well over 100 years ago uh, by a person called Emil Kreplin. And manic depression was replaced with the word bipolar, uh, of course, the condition bipolar disorder for a host of reasons. And it's meant to denote someone who has not only depressions, but someone who has manias. And of course, then the question is, what's mania? And mania is a severe disturbance. And like Kevin, all mental disorders, we think about it in three ways. How's it affecting your thinking, your mood, and your day-to-day -day behavior? And mania is no different. On thinking, people are often very distracted. Their minds racing. They often have lots of ideas. Nothing wrong with lots of ideas. Uh, Kevin, I know you have lots of ideas. But when those lots of ideas become poorly formed, a bit chaotic, perhaps a bit not in touch with reality, that raises a few flags. And then the behavior follows, where people are involved in behaviors that are uh, maybe a bit silly, not maybe carefully thought through, perhaps even self-defeating, or very familiar with some of the impulsive behaviors. Behaviors, maybe it's spending in excess inappropriate language or inappropriate interpersonal interactions. And then on the behavioral side as well, people often say they don't sleep very much or sleep much less during these times. And historically, when you watch Hollywood movies, uh, mania is always or usually portrayed as someone's very euphoric and grandiose and so on. And that can occur. But what's more common, Kevin, is that people are quite irritable. They're very agitated, very anxious. People say, oh, uh, people love being manic. That's not really true. Some people do. It's a bit of a romantic notion. Uh, some people like being a little mildly hypomanic, but not mania because it's very irritable and very agitating. It's, it's, it's extremely impairing. So it's a disturbance across thinking and mood and behavior. And right now, am I wrong, but is, is, is pretty well the, the, the primary treatment uh, is going to be medication. This is not something that I see a lot of other uh, uh, treatments applied to, such as CBT and 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 the like. This is mainly a, a medication treatment for bipolar. The way to think about bipolar disorder is the way you would think about treating if you had type two diabetes. If you had type two diabetes, you're going to need insulin or some type of drug like that. And it's just a bedrock of treating diabetes. Now, in diabetes, you want to eat better, you want a healthier lifestyle, you want to exercise. And that is very important, along with having your insulin. That metaphor would apply to bipolar. Medications are the bedrock. That is the standard of care. That's the science. But medications on their own are not sufficient. Let me give you a statistic. Once someone has had bipolar 1 disorder declare itself, and by the way, Kevin, it's what I call the 75-25 rule. 75% 75 of people with bipolar disorder manifest the illness before the age of 25. So it's a very early age of onset disorder. And after that very first mania, which defines bipolar dis uh, 1 disorder, um, as many as 40 to 50% of people still have not fully recovered a year to two years later. So medications definitely stabilize, but medications on their own are rarely sufficient to get someone back into the, you know, back to school, back to work, back to their usual relationships, et cetera. So cognitive behavioral therapies, supportive therapies, education therapies, even using peer support groups, um, they're all important, but it sits on the bedrock of medication. Absolutely. That's different than major depression. Major depression, uh, many people are doing just perfectly fine 
by never being on an antidepressant. They can be seeing their therapist, for example, and doing quite well. So that's quite different than major depression. You, this is the second, third time you've mentioned that you know bipolar and depression are different. So, so they are, are they from the same family, from the same tree? What, what is the relationship between bipolar and depression? You know, the field of psychiatry has struggled with this question, frankly, for over 2,000 years. This has been described in, in some of the classic writings dating back to antiquity. Uh, contemporary history picked this up around the mid-1850s, turning into the early 1900s. The first diagnostic manual from the, di uh, the American Psychiatric Association, you know, our, our sort of recipe list of mental disorders called the, the DSM, it was first launched in 1952. And and since this time, more contemporary categorization, we've really struggled, where's the difference between major depression and bipolar disorder? Now, on the surface, it's simple. People who have bipolar disorder have mania. That's called bipolar one disorder. Some people have milder manias, which we call hypomania, and they never get fully manic. We call that bipolar two disorder. People who have major depressive disorder by definition, do not have mania or hypomania. So on the surface, that's a very easy categorization. But when you get into this, it's a little bit more difficult. For example, we know that if a parent has bipolar disorder, just as an example, their children are at higher risk, yes, of bipolar, but because major depression is much more common, the kids are at higher risk of having depression. And it turns out that, that depression is genetically linked to bipolar one and two disorder. Um, and there's none of the genetics of bipolar that are specific to bipolar, which makes it even more complicated because some of the genetics are even linked to schizophrenia. What we can say is as follows, is that most people who have major depressive disorder at age 20 or 30, that is their standing diagnosis. And that diagnosis doesn't change. But one part I love to emphasize is that many people who have major depression today turn out to have bipolar tomorrow. I call it the 2% rule. In other words, if I had 100 people, Kevin, in my office today, and I said, come back in 10 years time, that's my next follow-up appointment because I'm busy. Uh, <laughs> they come back 10 years from now, uh, uh, over each year of follow-up, 2% convert into bipolar. So quick mathematics, that's 20 people. So we have this really difficult line. It probably doesn't really exist, frankly, between bipolar disorder and major depression. On the surface, it's mainly hypomania. But we get under the hood and look at the biology of bipolar and major depression, there's a lot of overlap. It's also something that can... You say that uh, it's associated with approximately 10 to 20 potential years of life. Uh, in other words, your lifespan could be shortened by bipolar. How, how, how does that happen? It's really interesting what's happening. And this is a broader statement, Kevin, about mental illness in the general population. We have, because of public health initiatives like sanitation and vaccines and hygiene, uh, we've extended our lifespan. You know, the lifespan of uh, human beings and 100 years ago was around 50 to 55. Uh, now we're up about 80 to 85. So in one dec uh, one century, we've gained 30 years of life. That uh, lifespan has not extended to people who have mental illness like bipolar. In fact, people with bipolar do lose on average 10 to 20 years of life. It's largely due to cardiovascular disease. It's in part due to suicide, but much more due to cardiovascular disease. And that's got a lot to do, Kevin, with something we're talking a lot about during COVID, that being social determinants. People with bipolar disorder on average tend to have less access to health care, primary and preventative health care. There's often more income insecurity, but there's also other aspects as well. For example, people with bipolar disorder, when compared to the general population, are more likely to smoke cigarettes, are more likely to be inactive, to be more likely to be obese. And this is why I always emphasize this point that when we're trying to help people with bipolar, we've got to manage not just above the neck, but below the neck. Their physical health is playing a role in not just in their day-to-day -day suffering, but it does shorten the lifespan. Now, this sounds pretty gloomy and doomy, 10 to 20 years of life lost. I mean, is this a fait accompli? Is this a done deal? Uh, no, it's not a done deal. And here's the part that I think is really, really important. The research shows that if we can get people 
on the right treatment and they stay on the treatment, they can almost fully recover that lifespan. So our medications and our, and our non-medication approaches are not just about improving livelihoods, it's about saving lives. And there is evidence now that some of our medications could reduce suicide and, as importantly, could reduce some of the premature and excess death due to heart disease. So it truly is a multi-multi-prong disorder. And the emphasis on physical health has now really come to the fore, not just in academic circles, but really in clinical circles. I got to tell you, out, out of the, the various mental illnesses, bipolar seems to be the one, as you had said, the more doomy and gloomy of those illnesses. It, it, it seems as though, you know, it can be very scary, especially for a parent of someone who, who, who has a, a, a child or a youth living with, with bipolar. It just seems like hopeless almost. Well, you know what it is about bipolar disorder, Kevin? Here's something which, I mean, I have provided care for tens of thousands of people who have bipolar in my career. And um, there's a complexity, uh, there's a frustration, there's an incredible um, excitement about helping people with bipolar for so many reasons. And frankly, it's what attracted me to this area was the incredible fulfillment I get in doing this. Admittedly, a lot of frustrations. I think if I was to step back and just sort of look at the big picture, where in fact I think the gloom and doom comes from in part, is that we as people, we are growing up in our families, we go to school, we nurture our social relationships, that's about your human capital. Now human capital in society constructs initials after your name, you get degrees from colleges and so on, but that's human capital. And the loss of human capital, the loss of your human agency potential, is greater in bipolar disorder than any other mental disorder. Said it differently, when you look at the difference between a person's education attainment and what they're currently doing with respect to employment, that gap is biggest in bipolar disorder. And that is enormously concerning and frustrating. And, and, and I've seen you know, people with you know, well-educated people who have not worked their entire life, it's incredible. But here's the point, and this is the part where I think we've really got to pivot. By the time people come to see someone like me, they've already had bipolar for many years. It's been very obvious. They've been bouncing around, seeing different doctors and therapists and so on. And like many things in life that are in the medical realm, it progresses. And progresses in this sense is not a good thing. It's progressing in the sense that it's, it's, it's getting worse across time. And many chronic diseases are like that. I'm not saying that when they come to see me, all hope is lost. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that hope was better if we would have got this diagnosed earlier. And what we now know is, is that if people can get the diagnosis made early and timely, the outcome is extremely good. And too often, here's the zinger, Kevin, five to 10 years, sometimes 15 years will go by before the diagnosis is made, despite bouncing around seeing a bunch of doctors and therapists and clinicians and so on. And so there is a overwhelming body of evidence that when people are diagnosed very soon after the illness declares itself, their outcomes are very good. It's, it's actually very, very good for people fulfilling lives, go on to have full human agency potential and so on, it's great. But I think we've got too many of these modifiable deficiencies and yes, it does, uh, lead to a lot of uh, distress and morbidity. It's no question. You know, and, and like with with many, well, with all mental illness, the early detection can mean the difference between uh, you know a, a, a quick recovery or a prolonged recovery. And it's like, well, it's like that with anything in in your body. If you get uh, if you get cancer found early, most of it is treatable uh, early. So this. What is being done about early detection as opposed to just research and treatment? This is so critical. And, you know, this is when I typically use the acronym DUI or when you use the acronym DUI, that usually means driving under the influence. But DUI in my world means duration of untreated illness. In other words, how long has the person had the illness before it got adequately treated? And simply put, the longer the DUI, the longer the duration of untreated illness, the less the treatment works. So what we have tried to do and what we're doing and actively, it is as important for me as a scientist in this field to not only try to figure out what's causing bipolar and how we can cure bipolar, I have to equally think about 
what's happening in the clinical ecosystem. We've got to get frontline clinicians, whenever they meet with young people, could be older people, but young people is where it usually starts, who walk into their offices and say, you know, I'm not feeling myself, I'm not sleeping so well, I'm a bit down, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. Symptoms like this, maybe smoking drugs, using too much alcohol. We have got to get every frontline clinician asking people symptoms about bipolar disorder because it's common and it usually manifests early. And that's a campaign to teach frontline providers all around the world, something I'm quite involved in, because it has been shown, by the way, Kevin, that when we do these types of initiatives, that is get frontline workers, clinicians who are seeing patients to think about bipolar and make that diagnosis, there's a better chance the person will get onto the appropriate treatment sooner. So this is what's called implementation. And here's a, here's a really interesting statistic, Kevin. 75 to 95 percent of all scientific advances are never implemented in clinical care. And so we've got to figure out a way to take the learnings of the laboratory and take it to the frontline clinic. And if the frontline clinic is not asking people about bipolar, then we're missing something here. So it begins with educating our care pro providers right across North America, around the world, which is what we do. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it that there's systematic, you know, and part is built into the electronic health record. So when you see your doctor, your therapist, your nurse, along with asking your age, your allergies, past surgeries, oh, by the way, have you ever had times of these types of symptoms? So just a quick probe. And usually the answer is no, that's fine you skip on. But if you have a, a positive screen, then we dig deeper. That's how we've got to do it. Okay. Well, let, let's get, let's talk about parents then. What, what should they be recognizing as, uh, as symptoms that they should maybe be asking their clinician, hey, is it possible this is bipolar? The most common presentation of bipolar in adolescence or young adulthood is depression. So if parents are noticing that they're, you know, a lot of kids are, you know, they go through moody times and temper tantrums and storms, that's, that's, I'll call it even normal or common. But what I'm talking about is a kid, you know, his mood is not quite right. It's going on a bit too long. Uh, often these kids have reversal of their day. They're up all night, sleeping all day often socially detached, school starting to suffer, uh, maybe, you know, using drugs. I think it's really time to say, does this child or this adolescent, does this person have bipolar? 40%, 40% of all adolescents who have depression have bipolar disorder. 40%, 40% of all adolescents with depression, I don't mean depression meaning a bad day because you missed your, yeah. you know, your friend on Instagram. I'm talking about depression that is impairing your life, that how you have a depressive episode, 40% have bipolar disorder. And so we've got to get people to ask about that. So the parents who obviously see the child, uh, the adolescent should bring this up. Hey, the nurse or hey doctor or hey, you know, a, a clinician, do you think bipolar is going on here? And I think that's really, really important because I think and I work very closely with the DBSA, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, which is an advocacy group for people who live with bipolar or have a family member with bipolar. We've got very active parental involvement and parents can serve a very useful role in really sort of helping kind of uh, navigate the healthcare system, but also being an additional set of eyes and ears which will assist the clinician in making a diagnosis. So this has got to be brought up. Obviously, there needs to be elements of support uh, to, the, to the person affected. And, and also trying to balance that with a sense of individuality, respecting the autonomy and the individuality of the person who actually has bipolar. And what I mean by that is, you, you know, the parents call me up all the time, say, my kid's not listening to me. They won't go to the doctor. They won't go to the clinic. Well, to the degree to which you, you have to respect that autonomy, but have this almost PhD level of support and pH level of just being consistent with the individual and try to guide them eventually into the healthcare system. There is, you know, this is something I go on about quite often. And that is, is that our system is not set up for anybody under the age of 18. It, 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 is, it is poorly, uh, not just underfunded, but there's just the services are not available um, and, and things sort of tend to just get sloughed off, you know, as teenage angst or, you know, he'll grow out of it or, 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 or that. It blows my mind away, this 40% number. Yep. 
And yet, and, and we know that. We know that 80, 85% of, of any mental illness gets its start in childhood. You got it. You got it. Um, absolutely. No, look, we've had a congenital problem in, in Canadian and in American medicine. Frankly, this is all parts of the world. That congenital problem is we just don't have a coherent, well-oiled, uh, accountable mental health care system. And it's been recognized. I've heard parents for years uh, express their terrible frustration. I've seen devastation. And if you were to take a survey of most people and say, no, not everyone, but most people, <clears throat> they've struggled with getting their loved one in timely into seeing a specialist in this way. What my hope is, and I think there's reasons to believe on this, my hope is, is that it's shifting. We're in part. This is COVID nineteen related. There seems to be more emphasis and more interest and openness to talking about aspects of mental health. That's one thing. Indeed, we have to talk about it. But we also can't just talk. We have to act. And in other words, are there resources? Are there infrastructure being put in place so people can have what I would call psychiatric first aid? Where let's say there is an immediate concern about someone. They're hanging out in the basement all day. They're 17 years old, not going to school, uh, dropping f bombs, not actually interacting with their family in a way that's uh, appropriate, etc. And even behaving in ways that are concerning. Most parents cannot get that kid to see someone. We've got to get that. And the resources and the brick and mortar is not there. The virtual historically has not been there. But now it is. We're starting to see some of that. And you could you could reasonably uh, assume that some of this virtual, which has just rocketed, you know, during COVID, that could be a facilitator that could help this process to some degree, not in all ways, but certainly in some degrees. And, it, and I'm seeing it play itself out. So these are not um, problems that are locked in stone, that, that are immutable, that we can't do things about. We certainly can. And we're already seeing that happening during COVID. And here's one, here, here's one example. Kevin. Suicide rates, for example, in Canada, the United States, in Canada has been pretty steady for the last oh, 10 years, 15 years. U.S. has been creeping up and up and up. Here's COVID comes along, which is not just a public health crisis. It's a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. And suicide rates actually went slightly down during this time. Now, let's hope it continues. I don't know where it's going. We hope it keeps going up. But here's my point. This has been the worst assault on mental health in our history books. And suicide went down. What's the message? This is modifiable. And it was modifiable in part because resources were put in place. So I hope it continues. It's, it's, it, 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 there's reasons to believe it could, but it's been a problem forever in our country and other wealthy countries. Now, wealthy countries, uh, the treatment of bipolar is expensive. The research into bipolar and the, and it, it is, it is expensive. So I guess not only are we not talking about, about treatment not getting to, to other nations, you know, third world nations, but even into our, our poorer neighborhoods here in, in Canada and the U.S., no doubt about it. When you look at what's happened during COVID, it truly has laid bare and it's really exacerbated some of this uh, uh, inequity, et cetera, that exists. And it doesn't just cut across ethnic uh, as well as racial uh, and economic lines. It cuts across uh, lines of mental illness. In fact, we've learned that during COVID, people with bipolar disorder are at much greater risk of developing COVID and dying from COVID. We, we had, we've looked at this and that speaks to, again, uh, insufficient access to care care and a variety of other factors. There's about a dozen factors that immediately come to mind there. But you're right. And the treatments can be quite expensive. Um, along with the medications, at least some of the medications can be quite pricey. Um, the issue is who's going to pay for the therapist? Uh, who's going to pay for my counseling? Who's going to pay for my, for my family support? Um, and historically, governments have been reluctant to pay for that. That's often a, a pay for play. you got to pay a therapist out of your own pocket, which is prohibitive. Uh, people often are not working they don't have the economic security and resource to do that so i think if, if health economists if they were on with us right now what they would say is yes it's, it costs money there's no question but in the bigger picture there is in fact a cost effectiveness to doing this um and in other words you uh, you know just simply based on the numbers uh, uh when people get good care uh, they're able to function better um and that then decreases the cost of the system um so i think there's a rethink that's going to happen we're seeing this now with covid as you know in covid uh, many provinces in Canada have been offering free psychotherapy online uh, during COVID. Um, I don't know how long that's going to continue for. I'm not part of those discussions, but heck, 
Uh, I think the population uh, wants that. I think, and I, I haven't surveyed people, but I suspect uh, as a community, people are in agreement. We should take care of people, what, you know, all the costs of fee. So I think you're going to see some of this continue. I certainly hope so. I don't think I'm a Pollyanna, but I do hope some of this, um, uh, you know, uh, ac the ability to access counseling and therapy at no charge continues. Uh, you you put me back on my soapbox right now, and, and I, I shout this whenever I can. Why the hell don't we pay for better mental health treatment off the beginning? We, we, you know, we're reticent to do that. However, you know what? Come back when you have a heart condition. Come back <laughs> when, when you're an alcoholic. Come no, back, you know, no, yeah. I, I don't understand why we would rather put out a fire than to prevent the fire from happening in the first place. Kevin, I've got to bring you to some of our research. <laughs> I've got to get you on some of our boards because I'll tell you what, you're bringing up this foul language called preventative psychiatry and shame on you for even thinking about <laughs> prevention. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I always make the point, why are we waiting in psychiatry till we got a five alarm fire before we actually do anything? Um, psychiatry is the only subspecialty in medicine even thinks this way. You know, if in fact you had some overweight or let's say you're smoking cigarettes your, your care provider is going to say you know you probably should change that you're at risk of diabetes you're at risk of this you're at, you know let's try and change this but we don't even do that in psychiatry and we can do that in psychiatry so you're right we need to find ways to be preventative and there's ways we can do it can we prevent mental illness absolutely we can there's evidence to show that we can can we do it 100 percent? no not yet but we can certainly make inroads on preventing mental illness by providing the adequate supports. Here's, here's an interesting study we're doing in Asia. For example, if you have a parent with bipolar disorder, the child, the offspring is at greater risk of having not just bipolar, but other mental illnesses. So what do we do? Just twiddle our thumbs and just wait till the fire starts? No, of course not. So what we're doing in a, in a study I'm doing in China, we're giving these uh, adolescents exercise and we're giving them exercise on a structured basis to see if we can improve their cognitive abilities and the cognitive uh, strengthening is like a vaccine, a vaccine against getting bipolar disorder. A separate study we're doing in Asia is we're giving people, you know, people who uh, may have a, a parent with a mood disorder, we're giving them cognitive therapy. Hold on now, why are they getting cognitive therapy? They don't even have a mental illness. Exactly, we're giving it to them as a vaccine. And so we're gonna try and strengthen their cognitive abilities to boost the resiliency because we now believe that this, the, the stronger those uh, mental muscles, the more you're resilient against getting that bipolar come through. And those are, those are just inexpensive, low side effect, very acceptable ways to get this, this thing started. So I completely agree with you. I went into this interview really feeling hopeless. I got to admit, uh, but what you have said, the fact that, that people like you are looking into this does give me hope. And when you right. say we're into five to seven years, you know, we're into some very exciting research and hopefully some, some results. There's reason to be positive. It truly is. There are reasons to be positive. I've seen amazing outcomes. We're, we're walking into a very new era. Technology is being not only made available to provide therapy, but also to track bipolar. And now we have treatments, medications, which we're, we're studying at my center in Toronto that work in one to two days. Kevin, can you imagine? <laughs> they work in one wow. to two days. Yeah, I used to think this was nonsense, but uh, this is incredible. We've got treatments like ketamine that we're giving that work in bipolar in one to two days. In everybody? No, not everybody, but in a lot of people. And that's wonderful for those people. And people deserve health. I've had it with treatments that take months to work. So have my patients. We want them better now. And we want them better with the same urgency that's brought to other medical conditions. I'll tell you what really inspired me, Kevin. The first case of HIV was June 5th of 1981. And I remember back when I was a medical student, when you had HIV, that was a death sentence. Mm -hmm. HIV is no longer a death sentence. HIV is a condition which is, in fact, called, the CDC calls it a chronic disease. I mean, it's, it's changed. Why? Because they got their shirt, their, 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 you know, the dirt under their fingernails, shirts rolled up, let's get serious. And there's evidence now that we can really change this game in bipolar. And it is changing. And you're seeing some of that now manifest in some of our clinical data. All right. I, I have taken up way too much of your time because you need to get back to research. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely amazing. Uh, I want to thank you so much for this. There's so much more we could talk about. Maybe you come back sometime. 
Would love it. Thanks for coming at Kevin. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Dr. McIntyre suggests that the next five to seven years will hold better understanding and some exciting treatments for those living with bipolar disorder. And you can live and thrive with bipolar. Just think of Winston Churchill, Ernest Hemingway, Frank Sinatra, Jenny Hendrix, Mariah Carey, and many more. If you or someone you love is living with bipolar disorder, even if you have suspicions they might be, I encourage you to find out as much as you can about it. I put Dr. McIntyre's information and links and some credible resources on my website, thehappymolecule.com. You click on links. Next episode, Mental Health on the Farm. A new campaign is shedding light on anxiety and depression on an often ignored but quite vital part of our world. Farmers next episode of The Happy Molecule. Until then, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Please consider subscribing to this podcast and also check out The Happy Molecule Extra at thehappymolecule.com. There you'll find a link to a video version of this episode. Be able to join the conversation about mental health, learn about our Facebook Live show, and get a preview of upcoming episodes. You can email us at thehappymolecule at gmail.com. I'm Erin Davis, wishing you good mental health. <laughs>